So let's begin with the basic idea of a basic guaranteed income. What's your understanding of it? So the idea very simply and at this, uh, to start out, I mean, this was a resolution brought forward by a number of, of colleagues, myself included. And so a quick shout out to Rachel Bendayan, Goody Hutchings, Julie Zerowitz, Annie Katrakis and Yasmin Rutanzi. And the very idea is we have learned lessons in the course of this crisis. And one of those lessons is that our social safety net was not fit for purpose. Millions of Canadians would have been left behind if the government had not moved quickly to reinvent our social safety net through the CERB. That is now moving forward through an EI tr tr reform transition process with a recovery benefit that will establish a minimum floor below which people won't fall for the next 26 weeks. And the idea here is let's make sure we establish a permanently stronger social safety net so no one is left behind we guarantee dignity and that we fundamentally end poverty in this country so let's let's break that down a little bit so since serb was brought in because we're in this emergency situation with the pandemic why would we need a long-term permanent solution through a guaranteed basic income because our current social safety net has too many gaps and in the same way we have seen our long-term care facilities and we have seen serious problems in those long-term care facilities in the course of this crisis i think a lesson learned is that we have to ensure that everyone lives in dignity in retirement no matter where they live well so too when we look at our social safety net we have seen too many gaps and the serb i've spoken to workers hospitality workers recently who called it a lifeline that they would have been out on the street but for the federal government stepping in and providing this benefit and we want to make sure that nobody, regardless of in the COVID crisis or outside of this COVID crisis, has to live on the street and has to live in poverty. And frankly, as a matter of dignity, we want to ensure that going forward, we have a permanently strengthened social safety net for all Canadians. Okay, so let's talk about some of the criticisms that we often hear about the idea of a guaranteed basic income. And the one of the biggest is the cost itself. Now, this is an issue that's come up a number of times over the course of the year. We know that um, the PBO came up with what the cost might be based on a series of scenarios between October 2020 and March of 2021. And they found that it could cost the federal government anywhere from $47.5 billion to $98.1 one billion dollars for that six month range to have a guaranteed basic income. Um, does Canada have the money to facilitate something like this? Canada has delivered the CERB and will have spent by the end of it about a hundred billion dollars through delivering the CERB and the EI reform and transition package. So I think we have shown that in the course of a crisis we can deliver. Now when you look at the PBO's numbers pre-pandemic, they assessed it when you account for provincial assistance and the rollback of some provincial assistance as the federal government steps in with a stronger social safety net, they pegged the, the federal spending at an additional $25 billion. That's about the same number that the Canada shall benefit we spend every year on. So is this something that Canada can do? I, I think the answer is yes. Now the question of where the money comes from, I mean, I'm not suggesting tomorrow we're going to see a basic in, in, a basic income guarantee in Canada, but we do have 26 weeks as of the end of September where the EI reform package is going to take hold, and we've got 26 weeks then to figure out what the permanently strengthened social safety net should look like. And there ought to be a number of detailed proposals, not only what it will cost and not just relying upon that single PBO report, but what it will cost, but also how we, how we can afford it and how we can make it sure that this is a sustainable government program going forward. Nathaniel, if I could ask you for some specifics. So in your best laid out plan, what would be a guaranteed basic income? Just an example of what each individual Canadian adult would receive through this plan. Well, so there are a few different iterations one could imagine. Right now, the CERB is delivering $2,000 a month to Canadians in need. It, when we look at the EI transition package that puts it on a more fiscally sustainable footing, for a longer period of time, we're looking at $1,600 a month. Obviously, it would be ideal if that number shifted depending upon where someone lived in Canada because the cost of living in New Brunswick is very different from the cost of living here in Toronto. So we can have reasonable debates about that. But the very idea here is not sending checks to everyone. It is making sure that there is a minimum floor below which no one in Canada will fall. I mean, we can certainly as a Canadian society afford it. And I would argue we, we, we really can't afford not to if we care about dignity and we care about ensuring that no one is left behind.
There's another argument that comes up repeatedly against guaranteed basic income, and that's one of incentive. That having something like this removes the incentive for people to work hard, to be industrious. To, when you reference dignity, the dignity and pride one gets from working hard, from putting in a day's labor, and then also it, that it could potentially remove creativity. You've certainly heard those arguments. What's your response to that? So we see artists call for this because it, it absolutely would not remove creativity. It would ensure that they can focus on their creativity. But when it comes to the disincentive to work, there is a way of structuring this to ensure there is no disincentive. And we see that when we look at the serve move to the EI transition package and the recovery benefits, now an individual is always able to earn an extra dollar and retain enough of the benefit that there's always an incentive to work, that it is a gradual phased out clawback. We see that with the guaranteed income supplement for seniors. We see that with the Canada Child Benefit. We see that with the Canada Workers Benefit. We already have existing programs that are basic income-like programs that get phased out over time. The more one earns, the less one gets, but one always is better off for every dollar that one earns. And that's exactly how this program ought to work. And the pilots that we've seen in the past, this is certainly not a new idea. In the 1970s, there was a basic income experiment in Dauphin, Manitoba. And the outcome was that people benefited from the basic income and they still maintained attachment to the labor force, except in two specific situations. Women who, before we had maternity leave benefits, were staying home. That's a positive for society. And young men who went back to school to reskill. That's also a positive. So the, the only significant experiment that we have that was completed, unfortunately, on, you know, Doug Ford canceled the basic income pilot here in Ontario. But that experiment in Manitoba showed that people still worked, and yet we could also provide the basic needs for, for all. What kind of support are you seeing for this idea beyond your immediate caucus and colleagues? Well, obviously, our caucus prioritized this number one out of dozens of resolutions. I think that's important. Six of us, as Liberal colleagues representing different parts of Canada, came forward to put forward different resolutions and then work together to make sure we hammered out one individual resolution we could all get behind. We see NDP member Leah Gazan table a motion calling for something very similar in terms of a guaranteed livable income. We see many senators, over 50 senators, have called on the government to adopt a basic income in the course of this crisis. And credit to Senator Kim Pate and Senator Francis Lankin for really leading those efforts. We have former senators, and not only liberal-minded or NDP-minded senator uh, or NDP-minded parliamentarians, we see former Conservative Senator Hugh Siegel, a longtime advocate of a basic income. And now we see former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, Conservative Prime Minister, call for a basic income as well in June of this year. And we know this is part of the Green Party's platform. So there really is a lot of cross-party support for this kind of idea because many of us realize the challenges of our constituents living in poverty, the need that they have, and especially in the course of this crisis, we have seen firsthand the impact of the gaps in our social safety net and the need for the gov federal government to respond swiftly and, and thankfully successfully through the CERT. We need to make sure that kind of thinking carries forward beyond this pandemic. Okay. Nathaniel, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Nathaniel Erskine Smith is a Liberal MP for Beaches East York in Toronto. You're watching CBC News Network. Hi, I'm Floyd, the founder of UBI Works. If you found this video useful, please like and subscribe to our channel. We make a lot of videos about basic income, and your support will allow us to reach more Canadians to show that basic income works.